Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Winning Life Podcast. As always, if you are getting any value out of our episodes, please do me a favor and follow us on Instagram, You Winning Life or Jason Wasser LMFT. Most of the stuff now is on my main one, Jason Wasser LMFT. And also please subscribe and share out the episodes if you think anybody else would uh, benefit from it. Today's guest is Juan Luis Bentecourt. He is CEO with really amazing background. He has worked for companies such as Procter & Gamble, Reebok, Puma, and Decathlon. He has a MBA from the Wharton School, an MA in International Management from the Louder Institute, both at University of Pennsylvania, and a bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard University. Juan Luis is also the board member of the Miami Theater Center and on the Wharton and Harvard Alumni Association in South Florida. He is now the CEO and founder of Human Intelligence, which takes AI tech and psychological assessments to help businesses, companies, and teams work better from a deeper understanding of how to collaborate and understand the motivations and insights of partnership, team collaboration, and leadership. Juan, welcome to the show. All right. So very much, as you guys heard, excited to be hanging out with Juan. And uh, we're, we're, we're just going to go right for the jugular because he and I just had a massively intense and amazing conversation pre-gaming everything. And um, I want to give a caveat heads up because he and I were just debating this, that you know, some people hear topics in the first few minutes of, an, of a podcast and they shut it off and they become disinterested. And what I want to challenge everybody is, is that Juan is going to share an incredibly important part of himself, part of his background, part of his culture, part of what inspires him to be and do what he is and what he is doing now and how right off the bat, we may not see the relevancy to the impact that it can have on the greater conversation. So I challenge you for the first five to 10 minutes of this conversation, not to be disinterested, not to fast forward and not to shut off the episode. But Juan, first of all, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thanks Jason for having me. So you and I've gotten to know each other more than a little, but not as much as we both would like over the last two months. And and what we were just talking about is what's going on in the world, obviously, with Hamas and the terrorism in Israel and and and, and the, you know the war that has been happening. And and we were talking about the shared atrocities in the world that people turned a blind eye to. And you started talking about your your Cuban background. So, you know, you you shared this idea that people, you know, either A turn a blind eye or are very quick to forget about things. And I'd love to start off the conversation with why that topic is so important and impactful to you. Yeah. So I am Cuban American. Both my parents are from Cuba left during 1960 when uh, Fidel Castro took power. And, you know, in a way I, I relate to the, the Israeli situation where people want others to speak up. Um, and I see the frustration when people don't for Israelis and Jews because similarly, when when Cuba, which was a flourishing country, uh, largest middle class in the world, they had trains before the U.S. by, I think, about seven years, mm. they had air conditioning before the U.S. I mean, it was a very wealthy country. Um, there's no, uh, nobody was leaving Cuba for the U.S., let's put it that way, for 400 years, from 1508 to 1960. We're talking 400 years. And there's no documentation of any poor middle class or rich person coming to Cuba, to the U.S. to live a better life, right? They would come and do business, but go back to Cuba. Um, one man, uh, Batista, the president at the time uh, in 59, was a corrupt guy um, and bringing the mafia to Cuba. And so the rich, basically, Fidel Castro was part of the rich class, uh, said, let's get rid of this guy. And they all financed Fidel Castro. The rich did, not communists, the rich, my family included, and almost every rich Cuban family that left, um, financed him to do a revolution to get rid of the dictator, Batista. Unfortunately, we didn't know that Fidel had other plans, and the minute he took power, he killed three of the four generals who won all the battles. He put 50,000 people in jail, and he killed over 15,000 people. So similar to you know Israel losing 1,500 people just in the initial attack from Hamas, Fidel Castro, in literally a week, did more damage than that to his own country. And it's tantamount not only of killing your own people and putting them in jail, he also then changed the system of a capitalistic, wonderful society 
with a middle class and highly educated, right? If you lived in Latin America and Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil, you went to medical school in Havana, you went to mm -hmm. law school in Havana, you would never go anywhere else. You would go to Cuba for education. That's not the case today. And so this is a great society. And all of a sudden, one guy kills all these people. And imagine if Bibi Netanyahu says, hey, everyone, I'm now Hamas, and we're going to make uh, the Jews Muslim. Like, right. that would be crazy. Well, that's what happened. And no one in the world even lifted a finger. And worse, when all the educated children of these families left Cuba, went to go invade the Cuba with U.S. support. John F. Kennedy, who in the U.S. perspective is a great leader among Cubans, they can't stand them mm -hmm. because he said he would help and give air cover. That way, no American lives would be lost. And he pulled out last minute with 20,000 Cuban citizens who've been training for six, seven years. They're all Ph.D. doctors, the most educated people in the world, left on the beach to get slaughtered and put in jail for the next 40 years. Right. And did anybody in the U.S. care? So to this day. Nobody cares about that Cuban story. Nobody cares about what was the greatest country for 350 years. Uh, nobody cares. And it helps me put in perspective the Israeli situation and the Hamas situation and the Palestinian context to not say things without learning more, without understanding his culture and ethnicities and history. The world's a big place and there's over 250 countries, probably 10,000 tribes in those countries. I don't know much about all of them. And I, it just, it saddens me that not everybody knows enough about things outside their own country, let alone Israel or Cuba or Rwanda or, uh, you know, Bagan and all these other places. Yeah. And I know that like, just from a psychological perspective, how people choose not to No, they, right. They choose oh, right, to turn yeah. a blind eye and, and, and we're seeing this like, and, and whatever it may be, right. Where, where, whether what's going on, it's not only turning a blind eye, but also justifying evil justifying these things whether it's about money whether it's about politics right whether it's like oh i agree with like some things that they may believe but therefore i'm going to excuse everything else i see this becoming a universal you know we see this in society like with cancel culture and with everything else and as you and i talked about like, like i'm a i'm a card carrying democrat but yet you and i right we we may i we you and i both look at every single you know news website we look at things from different perspectives we read books of people we disagree with that's a lost art that's a lost way yeah, well, to have I conversations how many people but, can say they voted for both Democrat and Republican in their life? Me, you. <laughs> I've done that. Right? And somehow whenever I meet other people who've done that, I get along a lot better with them because they seem more open to just open-minded to talking about different perspectives. Yeah. I don't agree with all of my friends on politics, but I can listen to them and agree to disagree. And that that's that art has been lost. And that's why we're in such a bad situation, not only in the U.S., but globally. Right. And, and, and now taking this as an inspiration for what you're, you're doing professionally. I mean, it, right. Coming from your story as, as, you know, of Cuban background and, 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 you know, the, the immigrant family story and by, by all means, your story is truly, you know, a success story in so many regards. And, not only that, right, from the academic side, from the business side, having a family, right, being being involved in charitable organizations and, and having now having influence on other people's lives. You know, this idea of like talking about what we were talking about, like with leadership that took over to destroy and you making a mission in your life to have leadership to uplift and connect has become a central part of what you've been trying to create, especially with your with your newest and uh, venture of human intelligence. Yeah, I. I you know, after 25 years working, quote, to make money, to 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 get to the right titles, my career took a change or a, a turn to be really purpose-based and uh, driven through energy from spirituality. Um, and we've talked about it in the past, but, you know, I no longer was beholden to companies and I launched my own company and I could explore other things such as uh, uh, a, a, a modality of meditation that the U.S. government through the Supreme Court made legal in 2006 um, called ayahuasca. It's a way of, connect, they call under the freedom of religion, it's a way of uh, deep meditation. It, it, it's misunderstood by many, <laughs> but it's actually a legal um, uh, experience that's kind of a form of spirituality and religion to the U.S. government where you uh, and can access uh, like through meditation, uh, higher consciousness and understanding about yourself, others, and the way the world works. And so through that, I launched Human Intelligence to give back to the world, 
and to help the world connect and for every person to be more self-aware, every person to be more emotionally intelligent, to connect with others and to do it in the place where that's lost, which is the workplace, especially now in a distributed workplace, human intelligence helps people connect and collaborate um, and be more productive where um, you know, everyone's more engaged and happy and every, and we reduce friction from writing emails to being in meetings. And, uh, it, it makes work more enjoyable when, when you're able to do that. And we're, we're leading the charge in that and being really innovative around how we do that. Let's take a, just another few minutes on what that looks like, because I got to see the back end. You've been gracious enough to to allow me to use it and to start using it with some of my clients. And and you know, you and I talked about different like personality tests and lenses and the and, you, know, my, you know my love of the Enneagram personality style. Um, when someone is you know, and the beauty of what you're, you've created can be now eventually, hopefully, which is part of our conversations, how it could be applied to other scenarios outside of the entrepreneur and business world. But I, I just want people to understand a little bit more of what you're trying to do and the tools you're using when that's happening through this platform. Elaborate on that question, please. So people are coming in using human intelligence. Companies are using this, right? And, and they're there's assessments, there's tests, there's interactive when you're on a Zoom call, there's ways of communicating, right? There's there's icons and emojis and reminders. Oh, so some but, of the, the use yeah, cases. Yeah, the use cases yeah. and, and some of the ways that like, right, because eh, it's, it's a tech company, it's a psych- using psychology, right? It's These are very generic, right? So let's go a little bit deeper. Like, so if I, right, the average company- Okay, so yeah, so, con- right, and, okay. Yeah. so I'll give you the conceptual description and then yes. the actual use case. Beautiful. So, so conceptually, we go to market and say, we have taken an industry of, of 50 years called psychometric tools or psychometric personality assessments. So picture predictive index, train finders, Berkman, Caliper, Hogan, uh, SHL. There's all, all these battery of personality tests. The problem with the $3 billion spent on those tools up until now is you take it, you do a workshop with your team or with a coach or psychologist, and it's a one and done, and you never really think about it again. And even if you do remember everything, those are the 10 people. It's not the 5,000 other people in your company you're working with. Right. And so that's been a problem. And so what we did was we took an assessment tool with technology and APIs. We embedded it in all of your workflows and all of your current collaboration tools like Microsoft Teams, Outlook, G Suite, Slack, uh, Zoom, um, and then sprinkled on it now with AI. So the following could happen. Like Grammarly, which did not come up with anything new in terms of content, they did not invent the the, the source or the right. dictionary or how to write better. And there are millions of teachers of grammar and English around the world. Um, all Grammarly did to become a $15 billion company was put those insights and that content where it matters, where you need it at the time of need in your workflow, in the email, in the Word doc. We did the same with psychometrics. So you take our test, Give it to 5,000 people. So you send a link to 5,000 employees, for example, at Coca-Cola uses it on a Monday. And when they open up their Outlook, one use case is they open up an email. And if I'm writing to you, Jason, I've never met you and I'm asking for a proposal for your approval or for a budget, um, I will click a button in my email as I'm writing and it will suggest how to write the email better for you. If I'm very conceptual and, and high level and uh, and decisive, I might be putting on you uh, a way of communicating that you could be detail-oriented and deliberate that you might not like. So completely opposite for me, this will suggest new ways. In our AI version of that, all I do is write my email, push a button, and it gets rewritten for Jason the way he likes to read information. So in one button, it helps emails get rewritten the right way. 38% of emails today are misread, misunderstood, cause friction, and, and you lose $20,000 a year from that. We fix that problem. A second use case, you're in a virtual meeting and it'll tell you you're doing training. It'll tell you how the group likes to learn. Or if one person likes to learn uh, uh, by pushing back and challenging with questions, you won't take that the wrong way. You'll see that that individual is, that's just how they learn. They wanna ask questions. Um, you might also see that one person might like to do self-study versus others who like to work team. And you might do a breakout that way. Um, if you're in a meeting and you need to influence somebody, it'll tell you um, that that person um, uh, is deliberate and you're decisive. You might not want to push them on making a decision that meeting at the end. Ask them if they want to get back to you at the end. Um, many examples of that. You can go into a meet. Every Monday you get a meeting, a list of your meetings two days later and on Tuesday, two days later. And it'll say, hey, here are your five meetings. And it'll present to you those meetings. And you click on one of those meetings in your calendar. It'll tell you the dynamics of that meeting mm. and how to run that meeting better. 
or that somebody may not speak up because they're shy and reflective. So how to be more inclusive and make those people feel like they belong. All of this at your fingertips as you're working. So it's you don't, it's mindless. You don't think about it. It just happens. And it's part of your workflow. And, and like Grammarly is changing the world to write better. We're changing the world to collaborate and be more emotionally intelligent and, and happier. Every single right use case is like, I'm looking at it as a therapist, right? So we're talking about emails and how many people in conversations of text, right, are getting lost in translation and fights are happening and, and right, you know, relationships are, are, are being broken up because someone read a text wrong or there wasn't the right emoji or Correct. there wasn't the right inflection and like, or, or it's not responded to timely enough, right? And, and then take that on a corporate level where not only just emotions are being hurt, but billions of dollars of productivity, can be lost and gained, right? Within this, within the, the wrong interpretation of an email, and and I see how profound this can be. And I also like interesting as you're talking about this, right? You're looking at like the five love languages. That's just another personality index, and and it's not like oh well, I understand myself. It's what's really not only amazing for what you're doing is to help people understand themselves, but also how do you interact with someone else based on their lens of seeing the world? Correct. When you're saying that person is challenging, right? I right, to see that person like oh they're not being an asshole. This is their way of showing that they're invested in this. This is their yeah. way of making sure that they know that they're doing it the best that they can by asking questions. And you may be like oh well what would he mean like I I uh, I'm going to take this personally that you don't like my ideas or that you want to ask more questions and you think maybe you know you might have that self doubt and you're being challenged by it. No 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 that person just wants to make sure. That they're doing understand the right, right, and to right to understand, right. and I think that's what's so amazing about what you are, what you guys are doing and creating. And when I took my exam, right, my 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 assessment, the you know, just as a cool, just so you know this, right. So what I when you're talking about like having it pop up on the screen, I want people to understand that there's like pictures of like different styles of like personalities. So you have like the maverick personality, which is like an air pilot, right, with their their really cool right, glasses and goggles, right. So I came up as forty eight percent maverick. 31% creative. And there's a person picture drawing a painting. And there are mine. I just put on the camera. Oh, okay, cool. So, right. So I have, I have to figure out how to, okay, Maverick. And okay. So you have the architect and the helper, right. And I got the promoter, which is so interesting because I realized that when I find something that I love, that makes my life healthier and happier, I want to share that with the world. And I also feel that like even this podcast, what I said to you before we started was don't be shy and think that you talking about your company, I want you to promote this because this is something I believe in. So this is not shameless for me. It's not like shameless promotion. This is anybody who I'm sharing time with. I want them to get their world, their word out. So, so it's interesting how impactful that is as a maverick creative and as a promoter, especially when you're, you know, being a maverick in creative ways. Right. So yep. that, that aligns with me and you have the maverick, the architect. So the structure, of creating things, putting things together, and then help using that to help people is really, really powerful. And like, that's what's so cool about this, right? People, if you're watching this on the video, you'll see Juan's, uh, um, what are the avatars uh, on the on the left of the screen. And that will make, we can remind you how to talk to him, how to how to connect with them, and how to hear his words more impactfully. So that's like, it's, 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 yeah, at the end of the day, you can't have human connection without understanding each other first. Um, and so we help you understand yourself. We help you understand others. And then the magic happens. Yeah. That's where human connection in life happens. At work, we focus it on collaborating. because We don't want human connection for dating at work. We want human connection for collaborating. But but this tool can be applied in all senses, even outside yeah. of work for families and for uh, relationships and you know patient care. We sell the hospitals to the chief patient care officer um, and customer experience and patient experience. Because when all your employees are working better together without friction and people are not misunderstanding emails to, from one department yep. to another, you're not cutting off the wrong leg and doing surgery in the wrong leg. You're not giving the wrong medicine. Patients aren't seeing nurses fighting. And so patient experience gets better. I mean, imagine the day you can order an Uber and pick a driver that you're really going to enjoy, right. right? If you don't want the driver speaking, you can pick that, right? So connection from Uber drivers to, I've had to find nannies. I had to meet 20 nannies to find one that my wife and I both yeah. like and and so all of this is around human connection. It's what the, makes the world and our experience in it goes around and, and we help with that. Yeah. And I know I have a client that personally left a job in a hospital system 
because they weren't getting and able to have that influence and impact and weren't getting that reciprocal that what they hoped that the department would be at by now before they even walked in the door and they weren't getting the, hey, let me allow you to get there. And, the, and because of that and that conflict in a system, he this person left and quit their job. And it's a shame because this person is such a passionate person, right? And when you were t- when we were talking about the idea of like money you know, what, what being you, wasted. What you said about that person? Yeah. I don't know how young they are, but what you just said is the biggest challenge to corporations today. Right. Gen Z's millennials, 64, 64% are looking to leave because they're not engaged and they're not connecting with their bosses and they're not connecting with the company. And there's this lack of connection and those Gen Z's and millennials are the future leaders of companies and companies have their hands tied. They don't understand how to connect. This would go a long way to help with those, that group of people. Right. And it makes so much sense because what you one of the things you and I were talking about is how much money is being wasted in cult, about culture and company. So I want to touch a little bit on that, right? Because I know you have your, you really do have your finger on that pulse of that. And you've been in corporate America and you've been working with some major, major companies, but let, let's, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, like you said, like, you know, you may have 15 people doing this, but it hasn't trickled down effect, or, you know, you might have a boss who's reading, you know, any of the wonderful leadership books by John Maxwell, but it's like, but the buck stops there and no one else is really getting on, you know, on the same page. Like they're not, they might give their team, oh, I want you to read this John Maxwell book, but then there's no accountability and, you know, things create around it. So when you're saying like culture in companies is wasting money and, you know, enhance, enhance a little bit of that from your perspective. Yeah. For the last 20, 30 years, all the HBR articles and all the thought leadership around culture had this belief that culture is monolithic, that every company has one culture, you know, built to last. What's the culture to, right? And, you know, there's a guy at, at Harvard Business School who went to MIT. His name's Don Soul, S-U-L-L. Go look up his research. He's at Culture Index now and on the side from his uh, academic publication. He looked at the five Fortune 500, what they say are their values slash their culture online. And then he did surveys of all the employees at those companies, enough to be statistically significant. And he found that, first of all, 90% of the Fortune 500 have four of the five same cultural values. So there's no way that 90% of companies have the same culture, just off the bat. Right. Okay. So it's ludicrous. But what and they claim their core values to be is too, very different. Well, they claim their core, most people claim their core values to be their culture. Right. And, and most state five, that's usually- right. Four of the five are the same for 90% of the companies in the Fortune 500, whether it's industrial, manufacturing, retail, Google, like they're all agile. They're all customer oriented. I mean, it's all top down CEO and board saying what, what looks good. Let's put it on the website and make people memorize it. And if they can say it, that means that's our culture. Right. Right. And then they have turnover, unengaged people. And and like, and they're trying to manage to that when people aren't that right. Second thing that Don Sol found was when they surveyed people at those 500 companies, they found that there's zero correlation in those five values at every one of those companies, meaning the companies think that that's what their culture is, but the employees don't think that those companies live any of those things. Hmm. It's the most, it came out a year ago, this massive study. And I, I, it was laughable because I've been saying that now for seven years with human intelligence. We have the data on so many companies. Um, the reality is culture is not top down. Culture is not monolithic. You don't have, the same culture at Coca-Cola USA is Coca-Cola Brazil, Coca-Cola uh, uh, China, right? And even at Starbucks, you don't have the same culture and the same job and the same barista role. And what leads to a culture performance in Hialeah, where they're all Hispanic or Latin, uh, Spanish-speaking people with Spanish-speaking customers, the culture performance there is the, the customer service person, the barista, they're going to come out from behind the counter. They're going to grab people's babies, kiss them, squeeze their cheeks of strangers, complete strangers, talk for 30 minutes, ask personal questions. And it's a 35 minute experience to get your cafe latte. And it's right. awesome customer service and their net promoter score is high. And, and they are the best performing store in, 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 in Starbucks in South Florida. You take that same group of baristas, those six people, and put them in Battery Park in New York City, where the people are going off to Wall Street and they want a one minute experience. They don't want to talk to you and they don't want any kind of connection. They, they want, want efficiency. Their kids. They, they want, want efficiency. They want quick. Yeah. That high performing culture versus Miami and Hialeah versus Battery Park would fail miserably and vice versa. And so it's ludicrous to say companies have one culture. It's even within the same job in the same company. And then companies spend millions of dollars on culture uh, in uh, impairment studies, 
are our employees happy or not? And they do, they used to do it annually. Then it was like six, every six months biannually. And then it was monthly. And now it's almost like these pulse surveys every week. Oh my God, they're going down the wrong rabbit hole. That is such a waste of time and energy. You could have a hundred percent of people loving the company, getting paid tons of money per hour, the best paid people. They think the company's the best ever. They'll recommend to a friend and everybody thinks the company's awesome. And if it's a customer service oriented company in retail and they're the best paid retail employees and associates, but you actually don't have people who are customer oriented and all they do is care about making money, that company will lose all their sales, all their customers, they'll never come back and they will go out of business despite having high engagement survey results. And wow. the best example is Microsoft and, and Apple have completely different true cultures. However, the engagement survey that they use is the same one and they actually have the same exact results saying that 80% are really engaged, love their company, 10% somewhat and 10% they hate the company, thought it was different. That doesn't mean they have the same culture, okay? You, you, an engagement survey, happiness does not lead to performance, okay? Engage, companies are so worried about the happiness of their employees, they're missing the need to understand what we measure at Human Intelligence, for instance. Are we a group of mavericks? Do we have... Um, you know, we, we worked with a restaurant up in Minnesota, 300 people was like the biggest restaurant in the city. Um, it was like a Chuck E. Cheese or a, a, a cheesecake factory. Mm. And they were the best paying, uh, best paid uh, uh, waiters and waitresses in the city. Yet their uh, uh, Yelp was one star. They would never get repeat business. People wouldn't come because they paid people really well. Those employees loved it. And all their temperament studies, they, they were a great employer. The employees loved it. They were getting paid a ton of money. They wanted to work there but they were finding people who only care about making money who are not service oriented. And so they were managing to the wrong thing. They came in with our tool and they said, we only want to hire people who are service oriented, sense of belonging to create a culture of belonging mm -hmm. and who don't care about money. Okay. And who are uh, problem solvers because you want a waiter. If you say, Oh, can you take it, the ketchup on the side or can you, you want someone to go back and ask and not just know just whatever's on the menu. Right. So service oriented and problem solvers. That was what they said. So they used our tool to hire within two months, their, their Yelp scores went to three stars within six months. They went to five stars. They put out two other restaurants out of business. It is now the number one restaurant in that city using our tool because they were measuring with temperament surveys, the wrong things, and with our survey and assessment, the right things. We want service-oriented problem solvers, not people who just want to get paid good money and yeah. say that they're happy at our company. What's so cool about that, and then like taking it back into different aspects of companies, or, or is is that yeah, that, those will be the things that you're looking for in the direct to consume right to the customer facing side. Now you have the back end; you might have a chef that might need different traits yes. right and then you yes. have the management team that might need different traits so it's not like this like people think about like culture as like this one size fits all and therefore we all need to fit into like you know that bubble but every role at a company will have a different culture and every part of the world where that role exists will have a different culture of yeah. performance and now there's technology and there's tools like human intelligence actually that can answer that question what is the culture performance for this group this team this division what is a culture of diversity of thought? How can we guarantee culture add and not continue to hire more of the same? Most yeah. clients we have are, are shocked that their teams are lopsided with everyone who reflects the leader and looks and feels like the leader. And it's it, it, it's a vicious cycle because when you have five people now who reflect the leader, let's say they're all decisive and self-starters. Well, when you bring up the, when the person does the interview, who's not a self-starter, who's not decisive, they're going to be like, oh no, that person sucked. Well, because they don't think and, and act like you. That doesn't mean they suck. You actually need someone to balance the team. Right. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that people keep hiring who they, who they like, not who's going to add more problem solving and make a team more agile, more innovative. And I think that's what, like when we throw out these buzzwords, right? The agile, right? I don't even get like how many, like I'm sure use how many of those companies use that word, right? And oh, their for thing, sure. right? And, and and looking at it like from just from you know working with families and couples, and and even working with my entrepreneur families or, or you know or entrepreneur and my businesses, that's these things still apply to basic relationship dynamics at home. Right. You're a father, you're a husband, you're not just an entrepreneur. Right. And, you know, what would it be? What would it look like to have an agile marriage? What would it look like to have a right agile parenting style? Right. But what about taking into consideration your your wife's personality and dispositions, your children's personality and dispositions and, and how this is so it, universally it, dude, you powerful. You just nailed it. 
the best parents will bring up child A, child B, child C differently because child A, child B, child C need different ways of being managed, of being incentivized, being motivated, of, of being nourished. Just like a boss, a leader needs to manage every employee differently. Every employee needs, and when I was promoted to Procter Gamble, I mean, they knocked into my head, like Juan, now that you're the boss, now that you're a brand manager, you have five people pointing to you, it gets, it gets in, uh, exponentially more difficult. I go, why? I, now I have a budget. I can tell people what to do. They're like, no, you've already missed the point. Now you need to change because before bosses were changing for you, you didn't know it, the good ones. Now you need to change for every subordinate you have. You need to learn to listen differently to motivate differently and to act differently for every subordinate. That's what makes a great leader. And that's what makes great management. Mm. And it, it, it kind of hit me in the face. I'm like, Oh, that sucks. I have to change for everybody else. Even though I'm the boss, ego goes down, service goes up. Parents need to learn that same lesson. And, and it's a challenge because that means being agile and a tool like ours helps you understand that yeah. for an individual, for a team, for a group, but most people don't have tools like ours. And most companies aren't like Procter & Gamble. <laughs> yeah. So I know we have a hard stop in two minutes. So uh, my last question before, obviously we throw out all the ways in which people can connect with you. And uh, obviously, you know, this is part one of hopefully, you know, continued conversations um, is what right now are you reading or listening to? that you are getting a lot of value from that you would love other people to like kind of put in front of their eyes and, and listen to and hear, and that's impacting you and uplifting you and, and informing you that to be a more complete human being. So I'm going to take a different tact here Please. And, and and not do a business thing, although this yeah. will help everyone with their business. It will help everyone. With it doesn't have family. to be business. Yeah. Perfect. So three things. Um, Everyone should read a book called Journey of Souls. Get past page 30, because up until 30, you're going to be like, this is crazy woo-woo magic. After page 30, you'll see why I'm recommending this book. I've read a lot of books in my life. There's no greater book to teach you about life and why we're here um, than that book. And it also explains your relationships with every person in your life. So Journey of Souls, buy that book. Don't buy version two or three, uh, part two, three, just buy the one that was done in 1990. Um, uh, so that's one. Two, uh, learn about a guy named Joe Dispenza. Yep, love Joe. I think it's a, it's a good first step into the connection of being the best version of yourself with spirituality in a way that's not kind of scary, offensive, or weird. Um, so uh, Joe Dispenza, learn about right. this person. And then third, learn about ayahuasca. Not as something to fix people, but something to get to whatever next level you as an individual need to get to. Because this is the greatest tool that, that the universe put on this planet for self-development, for consciousness, for understanding, and to reduce that voice in your head, which is not your friend, which is an ego voice that lives in fear and scarcity. This will be able to give you the ability to live in pure abundance, uh, joy and happiness at a high vibration. Not all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm not, we're still human, fun, but we're still human, but much more often than anybody else who's never done ayahuasca. Mm, love it. To be continued. <laughs> great thank thanks, you thanks jason so much for having me today we will absolutely everybody else please please check out humanintelligence.com if we're going to put all the, the notes in the link and how to reach out to Juan if you have any questions about how to connect with the company and again Juan, thank you so much and very much looking forward to our online and offline conversations in the future awesome thanks so much jason thanks brother we'll talk Cheers. soon feel Bye. good